tall, imposing, undisputed ruler of Imola's historical center, the Roccas Forsisca reveals, with its presence, the stormy events of past centuries, when the city was at the fore of endless political disputes and repeated sieges, and furthermore experienced the alternation of different rulers. This is the story of a formidable military architecture grafted into the defensive circuit of a medieval city. Today, its appearance echoes that of the Renaissance age, but what we see is nothing more than the result of unseasoned transformations over time. The story begins in the mid-13th century, precisely in 1259 AD. The statues of Bologna, drafted in the year, mention the fortress of Imola for the first time. In the year of our Lord, 1259, statues of Bologna, and we order that a fortress be built in the city of Imola. Only a few years had passed since the death of the Emperor Frederick II. The city of Bologna had recently overthrown the pro-imperial rule of the Imola people, enforcing strict legislation of political and military nature upon them. By the middle of the 13th century, Imola was a city that was swiftly evolving. The small early medieval settlement, heir to the ancient Forum Corneli, was experiencing rapid demographic growth, and the city had recently expanded its urban boundaries. The ancient Via Emilia was still the main axis of the city, extending east and west across a plain landscape marked by a network of ditches and centurial roads from the Roman era. The heart of the old city, clustered around the ancient parish church of San Lorenzo, was also changing its appearance. The public spaces desired by the city government were taking shape. The old town hall, a new system of urban squares and market areas. In September 1261 AD, at the ringing of the municipal bell, the Great Council met, presided over by the Podesta. It was decided to proceed with the purchase of a number of houses and private land located near the Santa Cristina Gate, in the southwest corner of the city moat, in order to build what had been required by the Bolognese statues of 1259 AD, the construction of a new fortress. Once completed, the fortress of Imola which had always been loyal to the empire, was to become the symbol of its subjection to Bologna, which led to the opposing Gulf faction. Even the garrison, chosen from time to time for guard duty, was made of soldiers sent from Bologna. Imola's submission to the ruling city was, at that point, almost complete. The fortress was a solid square structure surrounded by a moat, characterized by four angular towers, four others placed in the middle of the perimeter walls, and one planted to protect the entrance from the city site. The other entrance, which granted admittance from the outside towards Bologna, was guarded by a tower that incorporated the old gate of Santa Cristina. In the center, a high and mighty keep formed the apex of the defensive structure, as well as the last refuge in case of siege. For about two centuries, until the arrival of the Sforza family, the new urban fortress remained largely unchanged. During this period, however, the banners of different rulers wavered on the top of its towers. Those of the Alidosi family, Lords of Imola from 1334 AD, a local expression of paper power, and later, in the central decades of the 15th century, the banners of the Manfredi of Faenza, who had been entrusted with control over the city by the Visconti of Milan, the new hegemonic power in this part of Romagna. January 1472 AD, the Duke of Milan, Galeazzo Maria Sforza, Lord of Imola for only a few months, had already mobilized his engineers to get to work on the renovations of the fortress. It was Danesio Maineri, the Duke's trusted engineer, to be in charge of adapting the fortress 
to the new assault techniques based on artillery. A covered passage was built connecting the western city gate with one of the corner towers. With the earth excavated to widen moats, external defensive ramparts were raised. The thickness of the perimeter walls of the fortress was doubled. The patrol path now reached the width of four meters. Work continued unabated, even after 1473 AD, when complicated political agreements led to Imola being given from the Duke of Milan to Girolamo Riario, nephew of Pope Sixtus IV de la Rovere. The agreement stipulated that Girolamo would marry Caterina Sforza, the illegitimate daughter of Galeazzo Maria, thus strengthening the link with Milan. It was under the rule of Girolamo and his wife Caterina that the project to strengthen the fortress quickened. The four corners of the enclosure were fitted with mighty circular towers, with a scarp base that consolidated the old towers with a quadrangular base. Within, a residential palace with elegant Renaissance forms was built to house the new lord of Imola and his family. In the front of the palace, a courtyard was created, separated from other military areas, which in the original plans was to be porticoed on all four sides. The result of this construction feat, which we can in part still admire today, reveals further important innovations. The moat around the fortress was now wider and deeper, supported by perimeter retaining walls. The large cylindrical corner towers named in documents as Turiones or Baluardi in spherical form, were now the centerpiece of the new defensive apparatus. Inside them were small fire mouths for direct and cross-firing of bombards. The same fire mouths were recessed into the perimeter walls, now freed from the old median towers, no longer needed. The top of the dungeon was also adapted, replacing the medieval crenellated crowning with the bombard emplacements. The main entrance was also altered, now moved to the center of the city side and lowered in level for better cover from enemy fire. At the same time, the erection of two powerful outer ramparts connected to the fortress and the mainland by drawbridges ensured adequate protection to both entrances. By the time of Sixtus IV's death in 1484 AD, work on the fortress was largely finished. This is revealed by the presence of the papal coat of arms with a della rovere oak tree visible on the side of one of the towers. When Leonardo da Vinci arrived in Imola in 1502 AD, summoned by Cesare Borgia, who had recently taken control of the city, the old fortress of Imola, the 13th century Rocca Guelfa, presented itself as an extraordinary and extremely modern war machine. It can be recognized in the famous map of Imola, an invaluable document for the reconstruction of the town planning, partially drawn by Leonardo. With the beginning of the 16th century, at the moment of its greatest splendor, the fortress of Imola began its slow journey towards decline. With a definitive submission of the city to the Papal State, the fortress gradually lost its strategic function and was used as a prison. Some of the structures built during the Renaissance phase fell into disuse. The moats were dried up. The southern raveling, abandoned, was now isolated and had no connection with the fortress. A bird's eye view by an anonymous mid-17th century draughtsman shows us the state of the fortress at that time. New internal buildings for service needs appeared. The large courtyard, used by the military garrison, was now used as a vegetable garden. Part of the moat was now for farming. It is the words of the inmates, engraved on the dirty plaster of those rooms, or traced in red paint from the dust of the bricks, the shed light on the fortress when this was a place of imprisonment, hardship and resignation, as more than one witness obsessively repeated, bitterly denouncing their innocence. Even today, 
the older Imola residents remember the fortress as aloof and somewhat sinister prison place. But it was with its closure in the 1950s and the restoration work in the following years that a new history began for the fortress. The story of a public building open to visitors and citizens that still preserves and tells the memory of its formidable past.